Hello, welcome to Shamble Stay at Home Festival. Week eight, isn't it, Josie? Yeah, it's a long old stretch, isn't it? That is not the ebullient daytime TV audition technique that we've been using for the last seven oh, weeks, sorry. is it? Yes, it's week number eight. Who'd have ever thought week it? Week number eight, still the coronavirus, but let's hope it's all going to be, uh, you know, again, we've got a lot of uh, updates on that and a lot of other fun stuff in the kitchen as well. We have nothing Apparently in the kitchen. Apparently it's week nine, that, sorry. <laughs> week is nine, it week nine? Rough? Oh, week nine. OK, then we missed a week somewhere along the line. Anyway, welcome to the show. We have, uh, I'll tell you a couple of things. We have very shortly, we'll be introducing you to uh, Phil Jupiter, the uh, polymath poet, artist, uh, and the only human being, I think, that does uh, more shows than me at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And uh, I remember seeing him in week two, and I could see his face filled with regret that he had a 9am start every day. But we will talk about that. As there is no festival this year, we will instead uh, somehow imbue you with some of uh, Phil Jupiter. Adrenaline from 2019 or 2018. Um, also, Robin, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm. Uh, I've been out in the garden, so uh, I've done my weights. That it's just big enough for the weight. So I've done a little bit of exercise. I've been reading about the nature of the uh, sun, a uh, book by Steve Jones, who's brilliant. Steve Jones, uh, who wrote Almost Like a Whale, and uh, so I'm pepped up for this morning. And then I'm going to interview the former uh, Bishop of Edinburgh. So it's a good day. Oh, are you? <laughs> yeah, the lovely Richard Holloway. How is he? I think he's good. I'll find out more though. He's writing uh, a, a new book, and I was going to have a chat with him. With him, I was I was saying to Please Phil. Before, send him my absolute esteem and good wishes. He's the best. He is really delightful. If if you if people out there don't know about Rich Holloway became the, uh, eventually the Bishop of Edinburgh, and then kind of in in almost in early old age, he just kind of found that the church it just didn't work for him. Having reached that that uh, stage, and he wrote a book called Godless Morality, which uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, George Carey, uh, was not overly keen on. And, and George uh, Carey was actually quite liberal. Oh, right, right. No, he wasn't. No, no, oh, he was rubbish. Who am I thinking? Uh, no, you're thinking of uh, Runcy. Uh, uh, or you're thinking of Rowan Williams, or you're That's thinking, of thinking of any of the other ones apart <laughs> from George Carey, who has the face of a Toby jug. We did a really great interview with Richard Holloway on Book Shambles People Could Seek Out. It was really a wonderful experience to get to interview him. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that was for Waiting for the Last Bus, which was his book mm. about kind of old age. And and it's very, very moving because he's quite often his relationship with his dogs has come up in, in, in his books. And the, the, the sad thing was that in, in when, when he was writing that book, he's just right. I think just when he finished it and it was an end note, his dog died. And I did, I think, two or three events with him. And every time that he got to the point of bringing it up, he couldn't, you know, that emotion was so raw. But his 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 books are are, are highly recommended. Um, I was also going to uh, mention uh, that we have on today as well from uh, the Octavia Poetry Group, which is a fantastic uh, collective of poets. We uh, um, have uh, Ankita Saxena, who is uh, a just a, one of the very. I think I first met them at uh, Latitude, and uh, really great poets. And I'll quickly mention uh, we, this is the final week that we're doing daily shows. We as I said, we've done a lot of weeks of these and we've had a huge amount of fun doing them and we're very very happy that people have felt some sense of connection with them but we've uh um we're still going to be making stuff every week but we're not going to be doing a daily show uh after this week but we have daily shows every day this week but anyway so yes we have uh more poetry later on in the show and we have raised i think now uh twenty five thousand pounds uh hopefully which will be de- uh, distributed around uh, artists and art centers and other things hey josie have you got a show and tell today uh oh i wish i did i wish i did i i'm so sorry i do not apart from one welly boot i am um, i'm a mess today i'm exhausted my daughter slept through the night for two nights in a row as if to couch us coax us into a full sense of security and then last night she just woke up all night again as if to hammer home the point um so i'm sort of in this weird fug of not being able to parent beyond CBBS and not being able to think beyond my immediate 
exactly. So, yeah. um, have you got a show and tell? Robert? Yeah, I have, yeah, I have, but it's but I love that that bit where when you realise how immersed you are in just that the 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 rotation of of childcare, where you only know what season it is because suddenly on CBeebies they go, it's autumn, it's been <laughs> for us, and you go, oh, CBeebies has told me we are now in autumn. Yeah, they do that seasonal it's clock right day, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. right. that doesn't mean anything, CBeebies. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I, I remember meeting a CBeebies presenter at a gig, and of course, uh, the CBeebies presenter was drunk and had had a nice night and was just really effusive. But you go, but you're never, and it's such a stupid thing. But you go, but you, you're always a children's TV presenter. You, you must never go to bars. I've just seen you in bars drinking beer. Yeah, I'm not always just pretending to be a giraffe. Hmm. <laughs> the um. My show and tell is it's a film today because I've been doing David McColman said, uh, right, you have to do your 10 top 10 lockdown films. And I think this oh, is going to be amazing. today's. And uh, I always probably pronounce his, his name wrong. Uh, Atom Agoyan, uh, who is uh, an amazing filmmaker, made a film called The Sweet Hereafter uh, with Sarah Polly. In fact, Sarah Polly's in this as well. Um, and uh, Felicity's Journey. And yeah, he's a really interesting um, filmmaker. And this Exotica is one of those films where I went to, I think it was when the Swiss Centre still had a, a little kind of art house cinema there. And I came out and it's an utterly fulfilling film. Uh, in terms of it's a drama I, I warn you it says sexy funny mesmerizing right it's not very funny a little bit like uh Sinodokia, whatever it's called new york which has on the cover of its thing the funniest film of the year it's not it's a film filmed with existential anxiety yeah. this is not a laugh out loud comedy this is a film about loss and it's an incredibly clever film in terms of you you go with different characters throughout the film you go through their 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 stories and at the end, everything comes together and you realise what you've been watching. You realise the story you've been watching. And it's set around a strip club. But it's a very strange kind of strip club because it is, um, well, the, the main uh, stripper who we follow, uh, she does a strip to Leonard Cohen's Everybody Knows. So that gives you some sense of what the film is. But it's just to see, it, it, it's a really beautiful and sad film about loss of a, uh, a, a lot of people have allergic reaction to it. Its level of melancholy can lead to sneezing. This is true. But I, I would highly recommend Exotica. It's made, uh, I can't remember whether it's uh, Montreal or it might be Toronto. Beautiful soundtrack by Michael Danner as well. Um, but it just takes you through a, a, a story of terrible um, loss, which you don't realise until slowly. That, you know where those films that, that it's very hard with a thriller or a drama, I think, if you've set up a premise to then at the end of it go, oh, that's entirely fulfilling. That is a film that is entirely fulfilling. Wow. So Good. there we go. Exotica. Exotica. Shall we introduce our guest of the day? It's a bit racy for me. I won't be indulging, but if you like a bit of blue, I suppose. It, it, it doesn't go too far. It's not too blue. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Most, most of it's behind the scenes. In the, in the, and that's the thing is it, it's such a strange behind the scenes. It's a bit kind of prudish behind. for me. So uh, not blue enough for me, I'm afraid. Oh, there's a load of extras on it as well. Which <laughs> really, oh, how can I win her over to the Canadian <laughs> Art House movement? Oh, I'm trying to get David Cronenberg. I'm trying to get an interview with him for my book. I don't think it's going to happen. Wow. Oh, that. oh Just, shoot. Oh, that's frustrating. I love I've just been reading loads of his interviews and he's just man that that person is a genius would you like to introduce our guest Josie Long yes uh what can I say other than it's Phil Jupiter's ladies and gentlemen I'm so, so excited, excited. Everyone, everyone I'm, I'm so, so excited, excited that he's, he's on the show it's so nice to see him again hi Phil how are you it's Synecdoche New York and my level of disconnect in the current situation means that the nobody I'm going to be seeing later when I go for my walk on the Fife Coastal Path, uh, um, I will be saying, and they'll go, well, how was your day? How are you getting on with your lockdown? I'm going to go, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, bit, a bit weird because I was on a podcast with Josie Long and Robin Ince recommending me their favourite porn film. So it's, <laughs> it's going to be slightly tricky sell. To, but, you know, it's, how are you both? For the love of God. How are oh, you both? Just trapped in this loop, apparently, of Canadian, Canadian, Canadian art, art house yeah. pornography, it turns out. <laughs> and there was I, I thought, talking about a critically revered film. But, oh, no, it turns Canadian out I am art a base house fan. Scud. 
<laughs> well, well <laughs> Canadian porn. Can you imagine how well mannered that must be <laughs> as a genre. <laughs> I do remember though at the time of going to buy a ticket for it, knowing full knowing well full that, well that it was a proper art house movie by a proper mm. art house director, that I still went I I still had that level of embarrassment going where you want to go, Hello, I do know actually about this person's work and I, because there was a film called um the idiots do you remember the uh, the the yeah, film, yeah, the yeah, idiot, yeah, dogma yeah. film? Yeah. and a, a friend of mine who used to run uh screen on yeah. baker street nudity in that well i don't know if there's lots but what there is is at one point there there, there is uh i think the first time there was a a, a, a penetration yeah. shot in in a, in a mainstream film and my mate who ran the the cinema which was showing the screen on baker street he said you used to get people who would rush in for the first screening very much with a businessman look of as if they just said to like they're so sorry look i'm gonna have to cancel the meeting this bloody toothache i'm just gonna <laughs> go to screen on baker street he said and they would all run down and go and see the film and all of them would leave after that shot like they'd literally only that they've come to see a dogma movie this kind of strange art house dogma movie, but no they haven't they've literally uh, oh that's what happens and then they just walk out without seeing the ending Do they not have the yeah. ending <laughs> it was very, remember this was the late 90s film. i suppose yeah no you're quite right it's just pre yeah yeah, yeah 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 you'd have to you, your penetration shots you'd have to wait for 20. about minutes for them to buffer those were the days those were the days good lord so glad we didn't say today's episode was child friendly um yeah <laughs> so phil what have you been because you, you were telling us beforehand at the moment you're you're you're, you're immersed in in study i am yeah i'm doing um I, well i passed everyone would be delighted to know nobody cares um the my first degree my uh, my um my first year my foundation year of my art degree I oh, fantastic! Through. So I got through that. I can't remember Josie because I saw last saw you in Kakodi. Yeah. Um. At, at um. Is the at day James is James's gig? So I can't remember if I was actually at uni then. I think I might have just started. It, that was in December. It was. It was. Oh yeah. yeah okay. The election. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. That was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I should have just stayed in Scotland the whole time. Shouldn't I? I think you, you were talking about staying. And well, abandoning we, your family. I've had a very um, uh, cosmically unlucky break. In so far, we've been. I've been trying for about ten years to be able to get a mortgage agreement, and then finally got one and started looking in Glasgow, and then was due to go up and look at flats, and then the mm. lockdown started. And yeah, I'm like, happened. great, great, Yay. I'll die in London. Great. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, your your art degree, art degree I mean, you I mean, did, you did. Was it three years ago now in Edinburgh? Did that fantastic thing where you started every day um, in in the, the the National Gallery of Scotland? Yeah, sketch, where you would, sketch comic. Yeah, yeah. Mm, where I'd go yeah. and I'd do the digital drawings of various. I think I've got the the actual device that I use to take them here. So yeah, well, I would go to um, uh, I would go to various galleries in Scotland because, of course, as as we know, there's a wealth of them. Particularly, I mean, the three. The three main galleries, and I say three, there's actually four. Um, there's the National Gallery of Scotland and uh, then um, the National Portrait Gallery, which is down near the stand. And then out of town on Belton Way, there's Modern One and Modern Two. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a wealth of these uh, galleries. And I would, um, he says, getting his thing up there. So I'd do things like, there we are. Oh. There's a nice whistler for you. Oh, no, I was, uh, can't remember who that is even. So that's uh, the Thames by what's his face. So that's my digital copy, and I did like um, and I drew Fanny Adams, my favourite, up in the National Lady Agnew. Oh, you've just gone oh, no, off. she's gone off. Her. That's, that's probably a copyright issue, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's how sharp they are at the National Gallery of Scotland. So there she is, there, screen locked. There she, is she back? No, yeah, she's upside down. No, no, it's amazing. I'm enjoying, very much enjoying the functionality of my um, iPad using skills. So, yeah, so I would go and I would just pick a picture every day and I'd do a digital drawing of it and people were invited to come and sit with me. And so when it very first started, there were like three people that might have seen a little thing on it in the list. And by the end of uh, the run that year, there were about 30. And then I did it again for another two, three years. And, yeah, we'd have... Um, We'd end up, I think the last day I did it in Modern 2, I think we had about 70 people sat on those little portable kind of stool things, copying how, the same. 
Yeah. How does that affect your, your ability to draw? Does it make you feel self-conscious? Feel less self-conscious because you're sort of on stage? I think because it's it's you're not really you're not performing to them. They come up and they go, "What's happening?" Firstly, people didn't understand what was going on, which is I literally had invited people to come and draw with me. Mm. So I didn't have anything to prove. I was just drawing and then looking at what they'd done and going, "Yeah, I like that." That is pretty much all I was doing all the time, and and I would chit chat with them if they wanted. Some people came definitely expecting it to be a gig and me to be doing something performative and yeah. that never happened it was literally me sitting on a st- they come in and see the bloke off qi sat on a stool doing this all right and that that'd be it and they and and so it, some people were confused by it some people got to be there was a lovely lady who um whose name eludes me now she was from new zealand and she ended up coming every day and she and I think she did some sort of going back. At least she didn't go back to university. She certainly started doing an art class again. A lot of people, a lot of people seem to dig it. And also the other thing is I had a lot of people. I remember one point Valdemar Janicek coming in. Okay? And, then, and again, it's the thing is, what are you doing? And that was, that's always the get go. What, what, what is this? That's it. What is this? And I'm like, I'm drawing. I'm inviting people to draw with me. And they go, what? And that's it. And I would get, and they go, and people come, and I'm like, yes. <laughs> it was a really weird sell because the thing is, is I'd go, when I met um, Sir John that runs the gallery, I'm like, so what I'm going to do um, is um, I'm going to sit and I'm going to draw. What? That's it. Yeah, I'm going to sit and I'm going to draw, and people are invited to sit me. What? And they'll come and they'll draw with you. Look, it's not compulsory. What it is is I sit and I draw, and people are invited to sit with me because it's a gallery, and it's what really? Oh Jesus! And it wasn't until they saw that they had a bit of an uptake in morning traffic, and more people were coming in. And when once you've got twenty people sat on stools copying a picture, the people will perforce see that as an event. Mm. and 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 then there's a regularity to it and people get what it's about but you know and the thing is is that every year i did it for three years and every year i'd get lots and lots of press just about that people and and it'd be so what is it (laughs) every single time and i just spend most of my time saying well what it is is i sit and i copy a pink painting that i picked that day and people sit with me and draw what and that's it oh jesus christ and i was doing that for three years just explaining to people what was happening which is a man was drawing and people were invited to come and draw with the man so you know that was it it was great i mean i, m- I remember popping you in and seeing you know again about yeah, 9 a.m yeah. or whatever and it was so yeah. many and it and it also i think it's that beautiful thing which it draws people into the painting so i think it's very easy sometimes you can wander around a gallery and you realize you're not really looking properly or, or there's a yeah. bit where galleries of course have far too many paintings in a good way but mm. the point is I, I remember you complaining about uh i think it was the national gallery in london where you 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 were looking at what there's one wall in particular which oh, is yeah. just so much and yeah. it's incredible but it feels like a collage of art a cut-up yeah. collage of it's, art and it, you can't it's the room uh in tate britain that's got that had uh the the rough draft of Madame X by John Singer Sargent. It's called the something room. And it is, it's like, it's like they've let a 14 year old child put the paintings on the wall and uh, who plays a lot of Tetris. So it's just like, you know, it's, it's literally just a tessellated and they, they're, they're like 30 foot in the air. The top ones are so high that, and there's some beautiful work that you're like doing this at. And you can't really see because there was a there was a very interesting uh, thing that I heard. Um, it was um, your man that does revisionist history. Malcolm Gladwell was talking to a lad uh, from the Royal Academy. And he said, the dream of a painter is to get a painting. What they call is on the line. You want your painting to be on the line. And the line is between four foot and six foot above the ground. That's the line. And that's where you want your work. But when they're doing big shows, they have stuff under the line and above the line. And, you know, there's certain rooms that you want, apparently, if you're in the summer exhibition. Not that I've ever got into it. Um, and, uh, yeah, you, it's, it's, I find that interesting that there's, a, you know, there's sweet spots that you want your work. But also, you know, th- there is so much stuff. You know, the National Gallery of Scotland, they, they like them. And they said to me, well, what do you want for doing this? You know, and, I, and I'm like, 
we can't pay you, as everyone says when I do this art thing. Look, we can't pay you. Um, unless, of course, it's the old museum who did pay me um mm -hmm. uh they they just uh they they're like it's they say what you want and i mean i want nothing i just want this kind of i'd like this unfettered access and so the the thing that national scotland gallery would let me do is they'd let me into the gallery before it opened for an hour so my, my my wages for doing this was an hour alone in an art gallery that's an incredible, incredible thing. Oh, yeah. It's like, honestly, I felt so much like Charlton Heston in The Amiga Man. It was great, you know. That's and then what the, I, would do. I would do gigs at the uh, Ladies' Ponds in Hampstead for free. Yeah. If I had to have a swim before anyone else did, like the lifeguards. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Dream. Yeah. Um, yeah, the idea of going around a gallery on your own where you could just stand and no one's going to ask you to move on. No, no. one's going to walk in front of you and take a photograph next to the picture. You yeah. can actually just immerse yourself for a little bit in the yeah. quiet. I, I, I remember talking, I remember Steve Frost um, um, and uh, his dad, of course, Sir Terry Frost, uh, you know, great artist. And um, he was talking about his strategy for gallery visiting. And um, he said that what you do is when you go into an exhibition is you got to go twice and you go once and you go around at quite a clip and you're just like, right, check out this, check out that, check out the other. And then, um, and then at the, then when you, you know, then you go back and you've made a list of like 10 pieces you want to properly look at mm. and you give each of them about 10 minutes. Mm. You go around once and look for stuff that you want to see and then you go around again and you look at it properly and that's i find you've got to do art galleries almost with 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 lazy eyes you've got to kind of and go right what draws me what pulls me in and take a note of where they are and then come back to them i went to the picasso at the royal academy just before lockdown happened mm. um and uh soup to nuts it's one of the best picasso shows i've ever seen amazing absolutely amazing just everything they've got that work that he did for the opera he did he did set and costume design for an opera you know mad old sod but they got um rough stuff about guernica everything the blue guitar all whole, whole period everything marvelous but honestly rand absolutely that's the last time i was in the crowd was at that exhibition and it was, you know, I'm a member at the RA and that there's that lovely, oh, I love queue cutting with a membership card for a gallery. It's my very favourite middle class activity coming through. Um, yeah. But That's I what I miss that. most, actually. I think I was talking with someone the other day. Is, uh, the last exhibition I went to with Nick Revel, I went to see the Aubrey Beardsley at yeah. uh, the Tate Britain, which was was great. And, uh, and, I, and I only had time to do half of it. So I've still got yeah. that other half, which I, I, I will never yeah. see. But there is, I was thinking that that technique around the gallery, that the, the um, Frank Bowling exhibition, which the Tate Modern, if anyone hasn't yeah. seen his work, f look at it online. Go and, it won't give you the true sense of it. Mm -hmm. But that was exactly the same thing. I went around once, and then the second time you go, it's that. Because it's also been contextualised by them. Because you have that lovely bit yeah. when you go and see a retrospective where you go, oh, I see, he was very interested in Peter Blake, obviously. He must have been a big influence at the time. Yeah. Oh, I see, at that point he'd moved. And then you get to room three and you go, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. now she's found her. Now well, they found her. You know. I mean, it's like I'm. I'm only. It's only when you study art and you spend time just doing that and nothing else that you start to realise how the scene works. How it's a bit like the music business, really. When you re if you read Modernists and Mavericks, um, that is that's uh, that that whole history of British modern art from forty two to seventy two. No, from forty four to seventy two. I can't remember the name of the dude that wrote it, but it's my favourite book on art now. And you know that I absolutely love um, Art and Anti-Art by Richter. Well, it's, it is, and this is different because it's written by, not written by an artist. And I always like books written by people that were there and doing it, which is what I love about the Richter is that he's got his bias and he's not afraid to show it. But this, uh, the book about the British art scene, that modernists and mavericks do get hold of it because it's just that. They're just a gang of people all doing the same thing. And so they hear about each other and they visit each other and they nick ideas off each other. And it's just, you know, it's like the comedy scene. The art scene in the 40s, 50s and 60s was like the comedy scene in the 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, and, and moving on. And 
put it's the same it's people being influenced by other people going to see other people you know that same sense that art is talking about going to see bacon's work and thinking well why do i fucking bother it's like when i used to go and see kitson i'd see dan's show and it's like why am i even bothering getting up wasting the electricity in this microphone you know when you see him doing a show with fucking 140 tape recorders you're like what the hell is that? you know it's it's it but it's that, that what I, what going to university is teaching me fuck it do your thing your thing's valid as well you know it's not about it's about doing it and enjoying it and feeling that sense of something and so when i go to an exhibition now i'm not i'm not beaten down you know you know when i go and see you know it, you know, Titian at the National in Scotland. It doesn't make me think oh, I'm never going to be Titian. So why am I bothering painting? Wrong, you know, because there's always room to be Titian. You know, there's always, be, I'm going to be the best at being Phil Jupiter's is, you know, doing his weird mashup collages of Francis. There you go. There's Elvis <laughs> in the Wizard of Oz with Lucy and Freud giving advice to Dorothy, you know. Um, oh, I love a good collage. We we better, we, the oh, Dorothy right. Parker Shrine, you know. That's I mean, I, this is it. Is you just do your thing, do your thing, and don't get fucking hung up on where it's going to take. That's. I think that's the thing about doing a degree in your fifties is you've got nothing left to prove in your life anyway. You've done it all, and now it's just pure enjoyment and learning, and you're just trying to get that sense of like when you're a child is just sponge absorbing information. And and newness, newness is a great thing, you know. Yeah. Well, we're going to come back. We're going to come back to to you in uh, in a couple of minutes. We're going to go over now to someone from Octavia, which is just such a as I mentioned before, it's a really interesting group of uh, poets, and I'm very pleased that uh, one of them who uh, does many other things as well, well as 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 poetry. And uh, please now have take a look at the work of Anketa Saxena. My name is Ankita Saxena. I am a poet from London. I'm part of the Octavia Collective, run by Rachel Long and a former Barbican Young poet. Um, I'm going to read you guys a couple of poems that I've written in the last couple of weeks today. I hope you enjoy. The first poem is called Thames Path um, and it's about the feeling of euphoria that I get nowadays when I finally arrive at the river at the end of my runs. Running always used to be a chore for me. Um, I think in this day and age where we can't really do anything else, it's become a source of joy. Um, so I wanted to capture that in this poem. Thames Path. And when you arrive at the waters, they never disappoint. Your breath is loud and greedy. Your legs are clockwork, rusty. Your eyes have nothing but the grey of road, the occasional secret of a windy tree. Here, the sun blends like an immigrant in the sky she once owned. She has known what it is to be feared. The cranes salute, the sand is contoured, ships are solitary, moored. Bridges peak and fall like ballerinas. These static birds charm. These plains still like a page of poetry from above. These mud banks become the Goan coastlines. These wide skies are Kerala. The sun spills like our grandmother Sindur. We are the pilgrims from Hammersmith and Rotherhite, from Lambeth and Battersea each carrying the weight of hips, the responsibility of hungry lungs, each arriving, eager, expectant, enthralled. My next poem is slightly more political. Um, it's about the situation with migrant workers in India right now. Um, in India, there are, there are millions of migrant workers who include construction workers, daily wage earners, um, everyone who comes from their villages thousands of miles away to the cities um, in order to earn a daily wage. And because of the lockdown, they have been told to go back home. Um, and obviously that journey is a lot more difficult than it is for a lot of us here. Um, so I wanted to write a poem 
dedicated to them. Um, the start of the poem is a quote from an article that Arundhati Roy wrote for the Financial Times. So I'll read you the quote and then I will get into the poem. This is the quote. They walked for days towards Agra, Azamgarh, Aligarh, Lakhnow, Gorakhpur, hundreds of kilometers away. Some died on the way. Are in the theory. And here is my poem. Stay at home, they say. As if home is a body everyone can retreat to immediately. A body that is whole and loved and full. At the bus station in Anand Vihar, they say no, not that home. That home is too far away and the bus lines have dried, leaving seats scorching empty. Stay at home, they say, as if home is where we are already, as if home is where we can be. So we walk, filling the roads like drain water, when pressurised pipes burst and the cities are choked on things they never wish to see up close. Stay at home, they say, as if all homes are equal, as if one man's home is not another man's workplace. Maids, drivers, construction workers, daily wage earners, hand to mouth and now foot to foot, cramping, blistering, holding on to breath as much as we can, for this air is all we can own, all we have to ourselves, that which will move on as quickly as we clutch it, that which was never really ours to begin with. Stay at home, they say, and pray. Nine minutes is all it takes and a flame. As if all men have equal access to God, as if God is not like the rest of us, looking for the easy way out. So we become endless, turn our bodies into deers. This way at least the politicians will see us, living widows at the stake. Trees catching fire from one another, contracting heat, exploding, spreading, and then come on soon, slowly dying out. people go welcome back uh thank you very much very interesting discussion uh, (laughs) uh, um which hopefully you didn't hear um uh, (laughs) so we're gonna have uh more from her at at the end of the show as well um i really wanted to ask you um just about great exhibitions and you were mentioning modern one and modern two in Mm. edinburgh and an exhibition which i loved so much i went to see it in two different galleries was uh the paula rago (laughs) exhibition which was, yeah. I think, in an area like that, which is is built in that it's it's, it's a post brutalist way. I'm not entirely sure what mm. it is. You you kind of it, it feels quite an odd thing. And then going into the modern one and seeing Paul Arago's work, it's just uh, both galleries. It was magnificent to see it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I went to the opening night at uh, in Edinburgh, and um, I was wandering around. It's amazing show. It's a, one of those properly kind of breath. Every time you walk into a room, there's like, oh my. God, and you're looking at it and you're like, pastels, it's pastels, you know, things like that, you know. And um, I was there and a mate came up to me, I haven't seen in years, my mate Vicky. And, um, and uh, Phil, and I'm like, Vicky, oh my God, what you? We, we, we're chatting and I'm like, how are you? And she, she's a, she's a mutual friend's um, ex, ex, ex partner. And I was chatting, and I was, and her daughter's a, a, a friend of mine and she, her daughter is, a fabulous young woman who's gone into theatre design and uh, I'm like I was like chit-chatting with her and I'm like well what are you doing here in Edinburgh and she went Paula Rago's my mum and then gave me this weird look (laughs) (laughs) and I'm like and she was like didn't you know and I went Andy never mentioned this <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Paula Ray goes my mother in law. It's not something you make tend to drop into conversation unless they're idiots. But um yeah, yeah, it's, it's very strange. And then so I met and she went, Oh, I'll introduce you to mum. So I met Paula Rago at her opening night. 
Lovely oh, that's movie. cool. Yeah, kind of sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that film is really worth if you've not had a chance to see it. Because I imagine at an opening night, you don't sit down with Ian Rankin and just go, let's watch the movie. You know, you're there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it is the movie about her life mm. and uh, about the importance of art in it. And sometimes about, you know, not necessarily always, but, you know, parenting wise for both, both the, the you know, uh, her and, and, and her husband, they, they were off doing art quite a lot, a lot to, but it's a really fascinating story and about what turned her into who she became like for those who don't know about paula rago some of her most incredible and, and her later work she's one of those artists that the older she's become the more revered and and that's not revered yeah. of her past work it's the new work oh, she wow. is considered that's to be great. a major reason that um abortion was legalized in in portugal yeah. because she did a series of paintings um, which are incredible. I mean, they, they were one of the main pieces in that exhibition, weren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that prints of that exhibition were toured around when they did the referendum. And the yeah. first time they did a referendum, uh, it didn't get through. And the second time, Paul Rego's exhibition went round to different cities and towns. Yeah. And there was a, ge a genuine belief that the power of her paintings were the things that brought that in. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. No, I, it's that. It's, it's, and then there's something about now about the having a different mindset in a gallery it's not diversion anymore it's like what can i learn from this experience when mm. i go into a building now whereas you know two years ago i was out on tour doing a uk tour and it was just it was about it was about right what art can i find in weird places in the uk and coincidentally art uk check it out artuk.org ladies and gentlemen they've asked me to uh, curate a little online exhibition from the digital what they're doing is they're digitizing all the um uh, nationally held art in the uk part the british arts collection uh and i'm curating um a little show for them i'm doing some looking at all their collages huh. so i'm doing a collage exhibition for them which is going to be online next week um i believe but if you go to art uk um there's they're slowly rolling out the ability for you as a punter to register with them and curate your own online exhibition and send it to friends. Wow. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll um, that'll be, I believe since the 11th today, I think it's online in a week. Uh, the, the one that I've done. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. And you, um, I, I don't know. I'm always. Oh, by the way, can we also see your collage? Because we had to rush through those collages because yeah. we 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 wanted to get to and keep. Which one? I mean, there's a. There's, I've been doing because this is keeping body and soul together at the moment. So there is. Um, you see the picture. Oh, beautiful! There's a lovely. Dinosaur. It's a dinosaur. Oh, it's, it's a dinosaur. That's me. <laughs> that's me i'm a dinosaur so there we are that's um i do love i do love a lady cosmonaut i've got to say the dorothy parker shrine which i quite enjoyed putting together There's a little bit of what's what's really um I, I mean obviously very funny they're really funny Oh no! The thing is, is I've been unable to shake the tyranny of the punchline from my work. <laughs> so, what's wrong with that? I think it. You know what is wrong with being playful and funny as well as I know. But this is it, and so a lot of the stuff that I've done, and once I kind of the first project I did at uni, I was very up up myself, and I'm going to do what they want, mm. and then that was there was a basic first project that I kind of I was a bit I felt a bit flummoxed in, and then the second project was called what is drawing and i just went right what i'm going to do to start this is because let's not don't forget philip that you've been drawing yeah, since yeah, since you could hold a pencil you've been drawing for more than 50 years trust that instinct and so what i did was i um hello what i did was i um i i just did a cartoon strip about what drawing was but 70 frame cartoon strip called wow. what is drawing and starting with that that really loosened me up and it made me think well and then i just got loads of quotes about what drawing is and how people see it and i think what all three of us do on stage is a form of sketching we just play with ideas because we're not holding a pencil and physically writing it down doesn't mean it's not drawing you know and so i ended up at the end of that um project doing a doing a performance piece called absolutely nothing like you a pound mm -hmm. and what the project was was i would sit on a chair and i had a piece of paper and a pencil and a rubber stamp 
that had written on it absolutely nothing like you philip jupiter's original artwork <laughs> right and you came up to me and if you gave me a pound i'd do a I'd do a drawing of you a stick figure i got one here actually and i call them dislikenesses <laughs> and so the dislikeness is a stick figure of you and i'd ask you tell me something that you love and you tell me something you love so here's a dislikeness of phil jupiter's <laughs> <laughs> And what I do is I'd, you, I'd, I'd, right, I buy it. You, you give me a pound and I do the drawing for you. And then the very final thing I do is I offer to buy it back for a pound. <laughs> Can I buy it back off you? And they go, no, I want it. Cool. Okay. So the next person comes along, gives me a pound. I do the drawing. And then I go, right, I'll buy it back off you for two pounds because now I have two pounds. <laughs> and that process would continue. And I did that for two hours. And I only sold, I only bought back one drawing. How much for? Four pounds. Everyone else wanted <laughs> oh. to keep theirs. So by the end of it, the last person that sat down for me went, uh, I'll, um, give me a pound and I'll do the drawing. They gave me the pound and I did the drawing and I gave it to them. And they went, okay. And I went, I'll buy that back off you for 28 pounds. Whoa. I got up to 28 quid. Anyway. But then... Someone from the fourth year heard what I was doing and came in and went, what are you doing? And I explained the concept like I just did to you. And they went, draw me, draw me. <laughs> and, I, and I went, absolutely, that'll be a pound. I have got a pound, just draw me. I'll give you it later. I went, no, I need a pound before I can draw you. And she went to her mate, have you got a pound? He went, oh, I've got no cash on me. She went, wait there. And she ran off. And, she, and, I, and I knew what she was doing. She just wanted 28 quid. And who can blame her? And so she was exploiting <laughs> art. And she came running back and she sat down and I went, to, and I went, okay, thank you very much. Okay. So can I have the pound? She gave me the pound. She sat down. She's all, <laughs> she's all laughing and smiling. And, uh, and I went, okay, could I have your name, please? And she went, right, it's Nikki. And my phone went ding, 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 ding. And I went, terribly sorry, time's up. Because it was a, it was a time limited project. And she came in at the very end. And so, yeah. So um, she missed out on 28 quid. That is brilliant. Yeah. Like um, who wants to be a millionaire, isn't it? It's, it's really interesting, but it's, it was a project about the value of... So the people towards the... I'll tell you what, when I got to 20 quid, the, the girl who was at the 20 pound piece of art went, I went, I'll buy it back off you for 20 quid. And she went, oh God, I could really do with that. And it was kind of heartbreaking. Ooh. She went, oh God, I could do my shopping. And she went, and she, and she, she's like this. She went, nah, this is great. And walked off. You should but have slipped her a 20 quid after. I should, I should have. Done. You were a great contestant. Josie, I'm a student now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget, this isn't the Phil Jupiters of old. This isn't six music bus got Phil Jupiters. This is student <laughs> Phil Jupiters that, that squandered all his money on traveling and ended up with a daughter in America. And now I can't afford to go and see her. And now I'm a student. <laughs> <laughs> it's the classic story. It's exactly as Salvador Dali, of course, always he started on What's My Line, didn't he? And then eventually went into art. So it's it's just the normal panel show to artists thing. Um, we have uh, run out of time, and which is a pity because I would love to talk more about because yeah, uh, cool. art is, is such a joy. Well, like I said it really is I what I miss. Bringing you it, what, what I didn't, what you didn't see was I muted me Lee, and my daughter. Lee. No, Lily, darling. Oh, great. No, <laughs> no, no uh, what she did was come in, darling. You can't lean over there. She fashioned a crude trebuchet. She leaned and this into your faces to smell oh. the flower, so that oh. you could smell the jasmine. Oh, I'll smell it now. I'll smell the jasmine. Lady Boo. <laughs> oh that's that's some good jasmine right there <laughs> thank you so much thanks for joining us phil and i hope we'll do something like this again yeah um, so i'd love so to talk too. more about about um art as well and it's, I, I, yeah, such a... I kind of think that this this uh, that's happening now and the autonomy of the internet broadcasting that, that is coming together i think this is something that will endure particularly for us a lot anyway I, I, I was, can you tell her that Jasmine smelled absolutely top draw, by the way? It was so, I, I wished you could have seen it. She, It was literally like that. Um, you know that funny thing that somebody did on Vine where they were feeding Ryan, Ryan Gosling Gos cereal <laughs> and they <laughs> give the cereal up and Ryan Gosling. And it was <laughs> and she would be just pointing it at you and you'd be like, well, there's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, what's interesting to me is that when you started approaching art, you did a thing that you probably 
have never done in comedy, which is tried to anticipate what they wanted as opposed to doing what you wanted. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's it's, the thing. It's that it's, it's a complete change in, in your mindset. And it was only when you you let go. And so there's two things that I noticed about the art that I've made this year is all of it has got words in it, text in some form. And uh, there's a punchline element to it as well. There is humour to it. And it's, it's it's what I work with. And it's the art I like has got mm -hmm. is funny, you know. Um, yeah, that's 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 what sort of emerged. I mean, I did a piece. Uh, I did a, this. Uh, I did a piece. Uh, there's a coronavirus piece. This is awkward lockdown. <laughs> that's, as you can see there, there's Lenin and a right wing demonstrator from 1960s New York holding a sign saying the only good communist is a dead communist. Sharing a sharing room with Lenin. So there you go. That was my... Lenin, he's rising above, isn't he? he? Oh, he's oh, he's not. He's not. Yeah, <laughs> he's just keeping his eye on his Pravda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and we will uh, um, just to tell you a couple of other things. Uh, we're we're back tomorrow, and tomorrow show is it's weird to call it a special but it's kind of we are we're doing a show which is about both depression and uh, and and grief tomorrow talking about that we've got james withy who did the um uh, the recovery letter series and has just written a new book about how he deals with his depression and uh, also my friend rebecca payton who did uh, an incredible uh, monologue called uh, sometimes i laugh like my sister and uh, rebecca um has lost her father when she was very young and her sister was murdered and her stuff about dealing with grief and her knowledge of that is uh, is is in incredible and james as well i've just read his new book about dealing with depression so if you would like to ask anything about that and it might be a slight i i never know with 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 rebecca because she has a wonderful dark sense of humor we will be but that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow so if you would like to ask some questions or if you got please do send them to us it's actually 10 a.m by the way tomorrow sorry that's my, my error 10 a.m we'll be back uh with uh james and uh, also with uh, arlo parks uh doing music as well um on the 17th of may we're at the albert hall we're not we're all in our attics but we're still creating the show that we were going to be doing at the Albert <laughs> Hall uh, with uh, British Sea Power in their attic and Lem C. Stay in his attic. And uh, we've got, oh, yeah, it's a really amazing bill. In fact, have, have a look. We've got uh, Grace Petrie is going to be with us. Josie's going to be there. Helen Chersky is going to be there. Steve Baxter is going to be there. Uh, and there, there are many, many uh, other things, including uh, someone who uh, we have an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. as well, Kobe Smulders, who's uh, you will have seen in the Avengers movies and How, how I Met Your Mother as well she uh is uh does a lot of work for an ocean charity she's gonna be joining us as well so that's on the 17th of may we've never mentioned the tip jar we've never mentioned patreon patreon is basically how everything that we've made we, we're always making stuff this is not merely something we do during lockdown uh we're always making stuff and if you are able to support us for our patreon it means we can make even more we've got a new series coming out involving gravity and the european space agency uh with uh tim peak amongst others so um take a look at that and uh i think that is i think i've said everything i meant to say Josie, have I said everything I meant to say? You've done a great job. Right, I think I've done that. So thank you very much to Trent. As I said, this is the final week we're going to be daily, doing daily shows. Um, I hope you've been enjoying them all. There will be more things coming up very soon. Uh, we'll hold it this week, and then next week we're going to be doing some new projects as well. Um, and uh, we're going to leave you again with some more uh, beautiful work from Ankita. Go and look up uh, un underneath these as well. When these go up on YouTube, we have all the links to other people's work as well, the people you've seen. So go and explore their work. Go to Bandcamp. Go to Phil's page. Find out what they're doing. Keep all of those connections going while we're, we are not connected. I'm only on Instagram. <laughs> only... <laughs> it's the best one. We all yeah. know. I only do pictures now. I can't be done with words. <laughs> See ya. Bye. 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 So the next poem I have for you is, um, again, slightly different poem. This one is inspired by Jericho Brown, who recently won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Um, I'm always, I've always been very interested in form. Um, so I wanted to challenge myself to do something with his form that he created, which is called a duplex. Um, and it's essentially a combination of a guzzle and a sonnet with also influences from the blues as well. Um, so yeah, I wrote my own duplex and the whole theme of the poem um, is kind of about the London underground and how we are, or we, we are kind of riding underneath the city um, parallel to the graves of the city and I just found that quite moving, especially at this time where we're not allowed to commute but we are thinking about death a lot as well. Um, so this poem is called Daily. 
We are far beneath the roads and the graves where strangers from other lives lie buried, ignorant. Strangers from other lives lie buried and you, ignorant. Hearing the news in a language you only vaguely understand. The news is a language we only vaguely understand, clutching each other like troll. Clutching your mother. You travel to where bullets scale the city's arches. At bullet speed, we scale the city's arches, moving further away from home, from those who wait. Father, home will not wait for those who have moved on, but the world will contract, slowly come to a halt. When the world contracts, we come to a halt. Strangers from other lives lie buried. Where are the graves? And I will end with um, a little bit more of a cheerful poem. So I think also being stuck at home, um, a lot of us have been cooking a lot and something that I love to eat and make is okra. Um, so this little poem to end with is called Okra and it's just trying to celebrate okra in all its various forms and all its various cultures. Okra. In English, you are ladies' fingers, bulging with grease, shoveled up lips. In Igbo, you are christened okuru, frigid and flocculent, measured like gold. In Arabic, you become bamiya, slow broiled with meat or metaphor. In Hindi, your bhindi, nest of vermin and snake skinned, fried shallow or fragrant with scalloped edges. We, the soothsayers from Ghana and Guyana, Whitechapel and Wembley, free you from your sins, leaving our hardened fingers to spit and slobber till you are reborn, holier, pliant, tender. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me. Have a wonderful rest of your week.